Hey YouTube, Matt back and believe it or not, it has been over a year since we did the modifications to turn this Harbor Freight welder that I got for free uh, from AC to DC and made some other little tweaks to feed rollers and, and stuff like that. By far and away, like in order of magnitude, uh, the Harbor Freight Welder series is the most popular thing on my channel, and it's the thing that I get the most questions about, to the point where it's time to do an FAQ type of video. That's what we're going to do today. I'm going to run through the, you know, whatever, five, ten most common things y'all have been asking me about this welder and the conversion. Definitely one of the top couple questions I get relates to the parts that go into making this conversion possible. The rectifier here, I think, is the most, most troubling thing for people, and it's because while the bridge rectifier is readily available on eBay and, and is still right around the, the $20 price range, you'll find that there are two flavors of it when you go looking online. So the first flavor has a part number of QL100A or 1000A, something like that. And that's the one that I have here. It's the single phase, meaning it only has four pins on it, 100 amp bridge rectifier. That one is what you see in the series and it's a straight drop in. The other one that you see looks really, really similar, but it's marketed as a three phase AC rectifier, meaning that it actually has five pins. There are three input pins for the three phases of the AC and the two DC output pins. And so people ask, will this work? Can I use a three phase rectifier? And the answer is absolutely you can. You just ignore one of those third input AC pins. Tape it off, cut it off, whatever else. Uh, the three phase rectifiers have an extra pair of diodes in there to take care of rectifying that extra phase that you don't have, but they all do the same thing. The three input pins are essentially equivalent. So pick your favorite two, wire it up, forget about the third one, and go on your merry way. The other rectifier question that I get all the time is about the amperage. I have a 100 amp rectifier on this project, and people ask if it has to be a 100 amp rectifier. Can they get away with something smaller or maybe even bigger. And the answer to that is bigger is fine. In fact, if I had it to do all over again, I probably would put a 150 amp rectifier on here. Not that this thing ever gets anywhere near 150 amps, but that overhead just gives you a little bit more tolerance for running it longer, hotter, without, without fear of burning it up. I haven't had any reliability problems. This thing still runs as well as the day I converted it, but if you can find a 150 amp rectifier, I think that's your best bet. Second most common question is about the other part, the capacitor. Where do I find it? What do the ratings of the caps mean? Uh, can I use more than one capacitor somehow to add up to the one I need? Well, I got lucky. I picked up my capacitor for, I think it was five bucks at a local ham fest. If you have to order it online, eBay is still, I think, the place to go. While they can be purchased new from electronic supply houses, they tend to be on the expensive side compared to what you can get them on the auction sites. But what are the key values in terms of ratings you need to look for on the capacitor? Well, the first is the voltage. You will see capacitors rated with a nominal voltage, sometimes just called the voltage. And then many times they will have another voltage rating called the surge rating. The nominal voltage is the voltage that you can charge the capacitor to up and leave it there 100% of the time. You could leave it at that voltage for years without doing any damage to it. That's the one that's important to us because when we turn the welder on, we charge up the capacitor and it just sits there until we decide to pull the trigger and weld. Uh, actually, until we decide to turn the welder off and drain the cap. Could be minutes, could be hours, could be days if you forget to turn the welder off. So that nominal or continuous voltage is the one that's important to us. And while I've never measured anything higher than uh, low 40s in terms of voltage coming off the transformer, I think a 50 volt capacitor is probably the minimum you should be looking at if you wanna stay safe. For the record, the surge rating is a higher voltage rating that you could charge the capacitor to transiently for small bursts of time. 
How exactly long a small burst of time is depends wildly. You'd have to go look at the spec sheets for the individual capacitor. Bottom line, ignore that number. Look at the first voltage number given, the nominal or the steady state voltage for the cap. The second specification that is of concern on the capacitor is its capacitance, which is measured in a unit called microfarads. The first confusion is how microfarads are expressed. Some places you look, it'll be written out as the letters MFD. Other places you look, it'll be written as a lowercase u, which isn't actually a lowercase u, it's a Greek mu, it's the standard metric symbol for micro, and then the FD. Microfarads are essentially a measure of the size of the bucket of electrons that you can store in the capacitor. Going to a higher microfarad rating could be thought of as the same transition as when you move from a button cell or a triple A sized battery up to a C or a D cell. They're all one and a half volts, but the physically larger batteries can supply that voltage for a much, much longer time because they're just physically bigger and have more chemistry in them. Same with the capacitors. A higher microfarad rating means that the capacitor is able to supply current to your load, in this case, the weld, for a longer period of time before the voltage will start to drop. Just like batteries, in order to get a higher microfarad rating at the same voltage, the thing's gotta be physically bigger, which means it costs more to make, which means it's gonna cost more for you to buy. Anything in the range of 25 to 50,000 microfarads turns out to be about optimal for use in this welder. You can get a bigger one if you want, but the law of diminishing returns really kicks in. Essentially, as long as the capacitor can fill in between the bumps of our rectified AC wave, it doesn't have anything else to do. Going smaller than that will theoretically start to impact how steady your DC power is coming out of the weld, but I ran this without a capacitor at all as part of my testing, and it's still a huge improvement over doing nothing. So really, any capacitor you can get in there is probably going to get you 95% of the way. Third most common question is, will this mod work on the current version of this Harbor Freight welder? They now come in black cases, they have a different model number, and the new ones, very nicely, have the relay circuitry baked into them so that when you let go of the trigger, the tip is no longer hot. And the answer is yes, this modification will work on the newer welders. Now, obviously, the exact color and location of the wiring inside the welder is a little bit different. You're gonna have to poke around and make sure that you're hooking up your rectifier to the AC coming off the secondary and that you're, you're going out to the torch uh, before the relay that, that turns it off and things like that. But fundamentally, even the, the newest model of this welder has the same problem. It's a, an AC only welder. And so it benefits just as much as this old guy from the same modification. Now the real common question I get is about this. This is my ground clamp apparatus. I ordered this from amazon.com just cut off the clamp that was there and it simply bolts on. Uh, it's switchable magnetic. So right now it isn't magnetic. And when you turn the crank, it is magnetic. It makes a great, great ground attachment. If you can find some bare metal eh, relatively close to what you're welding to attach it to. Uh, this particular one, I kind of wish the magnet was a little bit stronger, but for a light duty welder like this, it's, it's fine. Only time I kind of wished I hadn't done this is when I was welding some pipe. The magnet has a V groove in the bottom of it that's supposed to give you a place to attach it to a round surface, but in the end it doesn't, uh, doesn't attach real well. So either if this had the stronger magnet I'd like, that would have cured it, or the reality is a good old fashioned ground clamp would have given me a much better grip on a round surface. So if you think you're gonna be welding mostly pipe or other round things, you might wanna think twice about this particular swap. People say, what about the fan? What about overheating? Uh, do I wish that I had swapped out the factory stock fan, which is kind of anemic, for something a little better, and maybe in the process gotten some airflow over the rectifier. 
Well, in terms of keeping the welder itself cool, no. I haven't found any need for more airflow than the factory fan provides. But the style of welding that I do doesn't tend to hammer on the duty cycle of the, of the welder anyway. I weld square tube, angle iron, things where you're making a one and a half to maybe three inch weld, and then you have to reposition something or move somewhere to, to move on to your next weld. I'm not running two, three, four foot long beads like you would be maybe if you were welding the top rail on a trailer or something like that. So if you're hitting the duty cycle on your welder or you're just not happy with how hot that rectifier gets, yeah, absolutely. There's lots of room for improvement when it comes to airflow in this welder. If you want to start swapping out or adding fans, I just didn't find the need to do it on mine. Somebody commented and said that my calibration of the wire feed speed scale was uh, pretty bogus, that they, they checked it and it didn't come out even remotely the same on theirs and that it doesn't stay constant anyway. I'm not surprised. It's going to vary a lot from welder to welder to welder just based on the nature of the potentiometer that's in here. And that it doesn't stay constant is a fair observation because since this is fed off the same transformer that powers the welding leads, the voltage fed to the wire speed motor varies with the weld voltage as you, you know, hit porosity or rust or, or whatever else. So the wire feed mechanism in here uh, is another place where maybe we can make some improvements. In the meantime, I still think this is a pretty good guide. Uh, just don't expect to be able to look up your weld in a Miller or Lincoln table and set it on here. We're not operating with that kind of precision. I guess the biggest question that I get is, would you do it again? Is this welder worth the investment now that you've had it for a year? Again, it's going to depend on your situation. If you're doing anything code critical or where the safety of people or property is at stake, then you're going to have to be extremely, extremely careful about whether or not this welder is up to the job. However, if you're like me and what you're welding together is heat displacement bars to hold wood chips in your grill, or three-point doohickeys to move an empty utility trailer around farm property, then odds are this thing is gonna get the job done for you. Is it gonna be the prettiest and strongest weld ever? Of course not. It's flux core, so it's never gonna be beautiful, and it's only 90 amps. So up to an eighth of an inch, you're in pretty good shape. Anything higher than that, you're just not going to get full strength, full penetration welds. Whether or not you need full strength, full penetration welds, it's up to you. If I was given another one of these welders for free, I would absolutely do this modification again. It's a huge improvement over the way it comes from the store, and it's fun. Oh, and I almost forgot, the most compelling question I get. No, I have not set my blue tape chassis repair on fire yet. Maybe next time. Until then, stay safe, YouTube.